Hi, everybody. Good evening. And and yeah, assuming the, the group, you know, it is really nice weather. If you guys are having nice weather, <clears throat> then I'll, um, then I expect that it's pretty hard to, to come inside right now for, for some people. <laughs> I don't blame them there. Um, so, it, you know, if we're going to be a small group and you have a question, you can unmute. You know, again, we can make it even even a little bit more conversational uh, as that goes. Um, and the worst answer I could give you to a question in the middle of the presentation is wait. You know, just wait; it's coming. But uh, I'll start. I'll share my screen and um, start with an introduction. All right. So, uh, yeah, my name is is Matt Larue. Uh, I work as an extension associate for Cornell University uh, in in CALS, the College of Ag and Life Sciences, in um, in the Applied Economics Department, where we do market research, uh, marketing research as well. Um, prior to working at Cornell, I worked for Cornell Cooperative Extension as a county ag agent. You know, we have those all around the state, and uh, I spent almost twelve years as a cooperative extension agent. That's where I did this project initially was with was through Cooperative Extension. I also work as an independent uh, marketing consultant. Uh, while I was at Extension, uh, I created the market channel assessment tool, which is uh, a way to evaluate the different market channels that farms are using to market their products. I did that specifically with uh, fruit and vegetable growers. And then uh, I also created the Cornell uh, meat price calculator, which is something I've, I've also presented to NOFA groups. There's just some of my background and kind of the field that I work in, which is mostly small farm marketing and research. And with this project, the question was, you know, can we use the factors that are within the farm's control to increase sales at farmer's markets specifically? Um, or another way to put that, is it possible to get more money out of the market that you're, that you're selling in now? And uh, not to go too far back in time, but when I first did that market channel assessment project, that research project, did on 30 different farms in New York, and we looked at selling, to, selling through CSAs, selling through farmers markets to restaurants, grocery stores, distributors, and so on. And we evaluated all, all those channels across multiple farms. And we found that consistently across those 30 farms, farmers markets were the poorest performing channel. channel. So farms put relatively a large amount of labor into those channels and received a relatively small amount of sales compared to the other channels. So here I was doing this research that, research that said that for any individual farm, and for this group of 30, farmer's markets are sort of the worst channel to sell in. <clears throat> but, you know, farmer's markets also have value that we didn't measure in that project, like getting customer feedback, getting, you know, market exposure and experience from, from participation in those markets. Really, where do you get your new CSA customers from? You get them at the farmer's market. They meet you, they see your product, they, you know, they learn to like you, and then they join your CSA. Or, you know, chefs might meet you at the farmer's market and then order for their restaurant. So that channel has value. Uh, and farmers enjoy farmer's markets. So knowing that farmer's markets, you know, we hope aren't, they're not going anywhere. How can we take this poor performing channel and make it perform better while we're there? And that's what this question really was. And then there are these factors that are outside the farm's control when it comes to farmers markets. Like, <clears throat> I, I understand that an individual farm could perhaps influence the number of customers that attend that market, but in general, you know, the length of market, the number of shoppers that are there and so on. Some of these factors are outside the farm's control. So we have to look at the factors that are within your control. And that's where we got this idea to uh, record customer transactions. And it, you know, it's when I first saw the point of sale app called Square that you can get on, on tablets and, and phones that I realized we have this opportunity to collect a lot of data here very easily. Uh, and this will give us insights on what to improve uh, the farmer's market experience. So hopefully everybody's heard of Square by this time. You know, even a lot of small businesses use it. If you go to an independent coffee shop or a bakery or a pizza shop, you know, they're probably ringing you out on Square or some other point of sale system. It's a very simple, um, you know, sort of cash register application. Uh, and really, you know, it's been around a while, but gaining, you know, gaining popularity steadily. 
uh, Square is not just a credit card machine, it's a data collection tool. So when I proposed doing this project in 2017, I went around to our local Ithaca farmer's market. Oh, I'm based in Ithaca, New York, by the way. Um, and you know, I, what I heard from the farmers that I work with was that, yeah, they use Square, but only when a customer has a credit card. Uh, and then, you know, they just have a single item in their Square, which is called, you know, sale. And they push that button and they put in the amount that they have to charge the credit card and run the card. So they weren't really using it the way it could be used. Uh, but it can be programmed with each of your items and prices. And then it can uh, quickly and easily collect uh, the, the, the price and quantity of every single item in a customer's order. So if they buy five vegetables, boom, 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 you got that recorded, the total, and then the time, date, and location. So you're already getting this you know, rich data set out of Square. In, in addition to what you can get from Square, for, for my 2018 research project, we, we recorded the crop mix for each market day. So the number of items that the farm had available for sale uh, at the market. We took a photo of their market stall each market day, just to get a sense of the layout, um, the, the sort of uh, the bounty, the signage, uh, and you know just what their stall looked like each day. We had the farms report uh, on the weather to us, just in general terms. We, we had like six different categories for weather hot, cold, and comfortable, something like, you know, pouring rain, light rain, no rain. Uh, and the market size, which would be the number of total vendors at that market, and then also the number of uh, direct, directly competing vendors, that is those that have the exact same products, uh, in this case, fruits and vegetables. And any other notes about market conditions, any, you know, anything that was of interest, like a tour bus with, you know, with 80, tourists came to the market that day, or there was a big music festival going on on the other end of town that day. Those kinds of things would be important to know. Way that Square works is that you have these little uh, literal squares on your screen of your device. And when you a customer comes over, just like a cash register, you just touch those squares and it adds it to the order. Um, you pre-program those with uh, the item's name, and the uh, price, so it'll do all the math, it'll, it'll tell you how to make change. Um, even if you're really good at making change in your head, you probably uh, might make a few errors or totaling things. So this just takes care of all that for you. Uh, you just select the items. Uh, when you're doing a cash transaction, there's no charge from Square. They only charge you to run credit cards, and then that's at like 2.9%, um, which is a typical credit card transaction fee. So. Again, if you want to use Square to record all your cash transactions, it won't cost you anything, and you'll get the full benefit of this data collection tool. The number one complaint that I got from the farms that I worked with before we started the project was that they were worried it would take too long to cash out each customer. Um, you know, they didn't want to get a big line of customers while they're sitting there trying to cash their customers out. At that time, what I said to them about that complaint was that you know it, it takes 10 seconds or less to cash out a customer. And I think that time is is worth it. You know, we gotta kind of have this sense of self-worth. We're, we're worth 10 seconds per customer to get this data that improves our farm viability. Uh, customers are used to lines and they're used to credit card or cash registers. So at the grocery store and other places that they go, they expect a line, they expect to be cashed out. Um, at farmers markets, lines can be a good thing. Lines beget lines. Um, if you saw two produce growers side by side and one had a big long line of customers waiting and the other one had nobody, you would start to draw conclusions, right? So lines can be a good thing uh, for your farm. It doesn't always have to be a bad thing. And lines certainly don't seem to hurt the prepared food vendors, which is sort of just a, a joke among ourselves down here in the Ithaca farmer's market region. Um, what we observed with this project was the customer transaction size. So that's the customer's total spending with the farm. We didn't track customer identities whatsoever. So you know, a customer came and bought something from the farm, walked around the market and came back and bought something else from the farm. We wouldn't know it was the same person, but we just looked at the individual transactions, what time they purchased it, how they paid, how many items they bought total and what those items were, what the weather was, uh, how many items were totally available from the farm that day, and then how many vendors. So what we measured with that data is the customer counts. So the customers per market and per hour for each, each vendor. 
the customer transaction size in terms of dollars and items, the total daily gross sales, and then the average item value. So, you know, if a customer spent $9 with you and bought three items, then we know that your items are worth on average $3 a piece. And then the item sales volume. So uh, for any given item, how much you sold of it, like you're, you're, you know, you sold the most units of garlic or tomatoes or whatever. The point of measuring is up here on the top here that ag economists have this old saying, uh, you can't improve what you don't measure. And I just turned it around to be a positive statement. You can improve what you do measure. And, it, and it's true. You know, you've, you've seen it in your production methods on your farms. When you begin to track something, you can find ways to improve any, any rate that you can find. So what we're going to do is apply that same thinking to marketing. For our project, uh, this was all in the summer of 2018. We observed 16 different markets with a different number of farms in each market. So it adds up to 204 market days. And, and I'll show you how I get 16 markets at the Saturday Ithaca Farmers Market. I had nine, uh, sorry, five farms recording their day. So that makes five market days, markets rather. Uh, and on down the list, you can see all the different markets that we had. So in any given week, we were recording 16 farmers markets. In terms of market size, uh, with the markets that our farms are participating in, I just lumped them into different market sizes. I felt we didn't really have any small markets which would be uh, 10 vendors or less. So um, we ended up with medium, large, and very large markets. You, you can see that the Ithaca Farmers Market on the weekend has 93 vendors of, of all types and about 15 that are vegetable vendors. So that's a quite large uh, market. And then some of these others are sort of regional markets around our, our area and, and they got you know a bit smaller. We didn't really have any, if you got it in the really rural areas around here, you'd find small farmers markets as well. So when we start collecting this data, we have to think about what the growth opportunities are. And it basically comes down to this simple equation that ADGS or average daily gross sales for any given farm is comprised of the number of customers that they have multiplied by the amount that those customers are spending on average. So it's a very simple equation idea and we can improve average daily gross sales on either end of this equation, right? We could keep customer spending level, but get but win ourselves more customers and we'd have greater daily sales. Or we could keep the number of customers that we're getting level, but get those people to spend more money and we'd increase our average daily gross sales or ideally on both sides. So that's where we started to want to get gather numbers on these two sides of the equation and see what, if we could influence them. So when you get into that, you start thinking about tracking customer counts, like we said, uh, by hour and by day uh, or market day. And then the customer spending, I'll break customer spending up into three subgroups, the pack size that they're buying or the item value, those things are you know, very related. The number of items per customer that they're buying from you and the price that you have on your products. And then the last thing to think about are your top selling items. Um, you know, high volume items like lettuce and tomatoes and garlic and things like that. So I'm gonna break into what we found on the project for these different categories. But first I'm gonna give you a, a, a big, uh, big picture summary for the whole project. So as I said, um, we collected at 16 markets a week from June through September. I mean, not every farm successfully collected every single week. So what we wound up with were 204 market day observations from those 16 uh, a week. The total customers for the entire project were 19,921. So let's just call it 20,000 customer transactions. And if you divide by the 204 markets, you get 98 uh, customers per market on average. The total net sales for the entire project that was, that was recorded was $128,000 or $129,000. Uh, and so that meant an average of $631 per market. I will quickly add that in my market channel assessment research, just a few years before this, um, well, almost 10 years before this, we were seeing a higher market average. So it seems to have gone down in the, in the last decade. All right, I need a little water. Okay, the total number of items that we sold was 38,000. 
So about 187 items per farm per market. And then the average customer spending across the whole entire project is about $6.50. Um, and since they were buying basically two items each, it's like those items were worth $3.40 a piece. So the average item count was 1.9. That's big picture summary statistics. You know, there's quite a range on each one of these. So when we talk about customers per hour, that range um, was anywhere from as low as 10 customers an hour up to 47, with the, with the average at 20. Um, that, that's the average of averages. That's why I told you n equals 16. So the I took the average customers per hour for each individual market of the 16 markets and averaged that, and we got 20. If you look at the entire project, uh, average customers per market is 98. And these markets range in different hours. So I hope, hope that's clear. Um, so if we look at customers per hour, then you think about, well, what's our goal? We want to get more customers per hour. We want to increase our customer counts. So I think about what are the means that we have to maybe do this. Um, I think the easiest gains are during your slow times. So think about movie theaters offer, offering matinees, right? Movie theaters don't necessarily try to get uh, do, do promotions or do actions to try to increase people going to the movies on a Saturday night because they already have strong attendance, right? They try to increase uh, attendance to their theaters during the slow hours with things like discounts on matinees. So you want to kind of look for the easiest way to increase your customer counts. Um, finding ways to draw people into your booth during the slow times. This could mean sprucing up your market stall after your big rush so that your products look great. Um, having you know good signage to catch people's eye and bring them in. Uh, again, with the display, bountiful, colorful, and visible. Uh, you know, stack it high and watch it fly is an expression. Being ready to make eye contact and smile. Uh, people won't respond to vendors who are sitting in a lawn chair, ten feet back, looking at their phone. So you want to be engaging to try to to, to get people in during that time, and then. Um, Free samples, yeah, you know, there's no reason to do sampling during your busiest hours. Do sampling when things are going slow. To try to get people in for that for that taste, and then maybe they're going to buy something. And promotions and uh, promotions. So when I talk about promotions, I'm talking about offering discounts and having sales. So let's say the Ithaca Farmers Market. It runs from 9 a.m. until 3. You know, if you identify a lull begins at 1 o'clock, you could have a sale on your products beginning at one, right? You don't have to put a sign up that says there's a, there's a discount on products till 1 p.m. when you know it's gonna be slow. Sell what you can at full price, introduce a sale towards the end of the month, things like that. These are just pieces of advice on how do we increase our customer counts. Okay, but the big one that we observed was get there on time, get there early and be completely set up and ready to sell preferably before the market begins. And so let me show you a, a graphic on that. This is a very typical, this is a one real graph from one farm uh, during our project. And this is how their sales would go. So the orange line is total dollars in sales per hour. And the blue line is the customer count. The numbers at the bottom are times. So 8.5 is 8.30 in the morning. And then um, nine is 9 a.m. and so on. So you can see through the course of this day that they have a real peak in sales in the first, well, the market officially opens at nine. So they have a real peak of sales in the first hour of the market. And then um, there's a little dive down there uh, and then a second peak around 11 and then sales, sales steadily fall for the rest of the day. So we saw this over and over again at the Ithaca weekend markets where, um, Serious local food shoppers are actually coming to the market before it opens because we have a traffic problem and we have a parking lot problem at our market. It's a very, very popular market. A lot of tourists come to the market. Uh, people come down to get lunch from the food vendors. And so our serious grocery shoppers are coming to the market as early as 8, 8.15, an hour before the market opens and trying to shop. And what I saw when I was going there was Vendors who were not set up and not ready to sell, and they lost a lot of sales. So I'm going to call that missed sales. And if you have an early morning market or any of those similar conditions, you know, get to the market 
early. And if, unless there's a rule against it, start be ready to start selling a good half an hour before the market opens. In the, in the case of Ithaca, there's no rule against doing that. And these vendors should definitely have been getting there and setting up and selling earlier. Then we have the period that we're going to call the peak sales. That's about an hour, the first hour of the market. And then we have this little lull, which is an opportunity to refresh and, and, and restock your stall. You know, bring stuff out of the cases, spray everything with a, a mister, make sure that the stall looks really great because here comes a second peak, another wave. I, I don't, you know, I can't explain why, but there's going to be another wave of customers and, and sales are going to spike again. And this is a very consistent picture across um, the markets that we observed, especially the markets that had morning start. Some of our late afternoon and, and um, evening markets had different patterns, but morning markets had this pattern over and over again. And then for the rest of the day, it's an opportunity to try to get people into your stall just to try to increase customer counts uh, with samples, promotions, smiles, you know, whatever you've got in your, your tool bag to increase sales. That's the opportunity to increase sales, not really in that peak first hour. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be looking at, or a customer counts rather. I wouldn't really be looking at that. All right, and, and you know, this article came out in November of 2020. So our project was in the summer of 2018. And this article is about this one particular vendor. He's got a video on YouTube that you can look up um, and, and just look at this quote from him. He says that at 8.15, the locals start coming in. They line up in front of the farm booths. And by 10 o'clock, I'm basically sitting around. And then there's very little sales for the rest of the market. So he was talking about just what we had observed. This is, he happens to be a meat vendor. Um, and the article goes on. It's, it's really talking about sort of the problem that they've created in, in attracting tourists to the market and scaring away the locals. But that's, that's a whole nother topic. But the point is that he was observing the same thing that we were observing. First hour is intense. Shoppers, you know, local shoppers will come in as much as 45 minutes before the market opens. Uh, but then they're going to scurry off because there's going to be a traffic problem and a parking problem. Look up his video if you want. It's pretty interesting. Um, because, all, well, the point of the article, too, was that that all changed during COVID. They had such restrictions on the markets that the locals all came back and, and all the vendors experienced really strong sales. Um, all right, so now I'm going to change subjects and talk about the product mix or sort of the best selling items. This is a, a list of the best selling items for our project uh, across all farms. Now, when I call these the top selling items, I don't know why. So I have it written in there. You know, is it just because these are the most common crops across all farms in the longest seasons? You know, we see here tomatoes, lettuce mix, head lettuce, cherry tomatoes, beets. You know, these would be items that they could have a really long season on and that perhaps every single farm in the project was growing. So that may be some of why they're the top selling items. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what people want the most. Um, but when you collect data like this, then you'll, then you'll have it for yourself and you'll know for your farm, what are your top selling crops? And frankly, there's an opportunity if you, got, if you went beyond the top 20 to look at some of these poor performing crops and evaluate if you should continue to produce them or if perhaps you should offer more variants of the top selling crops. Um, what we have here is the number of times a unit of these crops sold regardless of the unit and then the total sales in dollars. So I just wanna be clear, some farms sell tomatoes by the pound, <clears throat> some by the each, some by the quart, right? It doesn't matter. This was just a customer bought a tomato and, and we counted it as one. And so 2,161 times, People bought tomatoes and they spent $11,900 doing so. This will come into play a few slides from now and be a little bit more important. And yeah, if you, if you look between lettuce mix and head lettuce, that's really the top selling item. Um, significant sales in lettuces. All right, so let's talk about customer spending and customer transaction size. What we were talking about before was customer counts and then the top selling items. So the customer transaction size across all the farms that participated, there was quite a range, you know, from $5 uh, up to almost $8. And 
The average across all of the markets was $6.35 a transaction and across all the transactions was $6.47. So we know it's right in between there. $6.40 is the, is the average that a customer is going to spend it on produce at these farmers markets in 2018. Our goal is to increase customer spending. So each customer we get, we want them to spend a little bit more. The tools that we have available to us are the product package size, the way that we sell the item, the item value, which is you know, hand in hand with product pack size, the number of items that our customers are buying from us, and then pricing. So I'm going to take those three and talk about each one of them in more detail. For product pack size, the goal is to increase the minimum amount that a customer can spend with us. That's going to have a positive impact on our average customer transaction size. So think about the product format and the opportunity to charge customers more through product size. So not a price increase, but a different package size. Uh, an example that I can give you here is instead of selling garlic for $1.50 a head, tie those two heads of garlic together or put them in a pint container and make them two for three. It's the same price to the customer. You're just asking for them to buy more or make a bigger commitment, if you will, or even better, three heads in a pint container for four fifty. So we're just eliminating the option of only buying one head and only spending a dollar fifty when you visit my stall. You're going to visit my stall. You're going to spend three bucks, right? That's the idea. Same with kale. Um, when I moved to Ithaca in 2007, a bunch of kale was three dollars. In 2018, a bunch of kale was three dollars. Um, so this is something that when I did this slide locally for the farms that participated, the first slide said, where is the $4 kale? Because kale prices haven't changed in a really long time. But um, my suggestion, if, if they were sensitive about raising their prices, was to create slightly larger bunches of kale by adding more stems per bunch and charging $4. It's just an example of how you can use the product package size to influence customer spending positively for the farm. The basic idea is to eliminate low price items, low price sizes. Another thing about uh, product pack size, you can do this. I, I know people get anxious when we start talking about pricing and we're really talking about package size here, but it feels like a price change. The changes that you make are not carved in stone. You can always change back. You can test something out, see how it works. <clears throat> if you receive negative customer feedback, you can always change it back. The other thing is that you can always accommodate customers. So let's take my garlic example. If you say that garlic is two heads for $3 and someone comes along and says, can I just buy one head of garlic from you? You can always accommodate that customer. The idea is to try to get most of your customers to change their behavior. Now on that note, um, go back to our top 20 best selling items and look at garlic. When you sell 923 units or garlic items for $2,900, that's an average spend of $3.20. So what we can use is this data to tell us that in essence, people are already spending over $3 on average when they buy garlic. I hope you can follow my logic there. If we take the number of units sold and the amount of cash that we got and divide, they're already on average spending $3.20 to buy garlic. So we shouldn't be worried about grouping garlic into $3 bundles. It actually seems ideal, right? So we could use this data to inform our decision, which is a nice perk of collecting data. All right, so item value, very similar to product package size. It's just looking at um, our item value and finding ways to increase it. The average value of all the items sold in this project, the, the 38,000 items, was $3.38. That included a few oddball items like honey, maple syrup, jams, jellies, and sort of like a uh, salsa. And I suspect that if we subtracted those higher value items out, that our average item value would drop closer to three, which is kind of what we expect from, from mixed fruits and vegetables would be the average item is, is at $3. So we'd want to find a way to just increase up from $3. Um, the simplest way, you know, mathematically, is to eliminate any opportunity at your stall to spend less than $3.
right? If, if we don't let people buy anything worth less than $3, then it automatically begins to drive our average item value higher. Um, how do we do this? We can bundle low priced items together like we did with the garlic. We can just eliminate low value items uh, and we can make price changes. I'm gonna go very quickly over the next slide, but I included it when I came to the winter conference um, in person and they told me I should keep it in. I'm gonna talk totally off. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you're laughing, Bill. I really debate this slide every single time, but totally off the farming world. I'm just gonna talk about my own experience. In addition to working in agriculture, I sell parts for Volvos and, and Saabs. And um, thanks to a challenge from my dad, I started tracking all my sales in 2011. And I looked at, I looked at uh, average item value for the items that I was selling. And um, I made a conscious decision to try to increase that number. So you can see where through the years, you know, it increases in small amounts year over year. The way that I did that was first of all, I stopped listing for sale low value items. I stopped buying them as well, right, into my inventory. Uh, I raised my prices on some items so that they were worth more. And I would bundle low price items, like a little, you know, a little trim clip. If it's only worth a dollar, then I'll sell it in, in a bag of 20 of them, right? So that it's a $20 item instead of a $1 item. So I'm just telling you that, you know, I actually have a little experience in this field and uh, that it can be done if you track it and you, and you monitor, you can um, have a positive effect on that. And you can see it didn't hurt uh, me in terms of the number of items that I sold or in my total sales per year. So it had a real positive effect. So going back to vegetables, thanks for, I just wanted to give it a real world example. All right, so now we're gonna look at uh, ways to positively influence the, the size of customer transactions by looking at the number of items our customers buy. On average, they were buying, let's call it two items across all these markets. So we could increase our, you know, as an individual farm, increase our average by getting more of our one item customers to buy a second item, right? Just talking about improving an average. So not that we have to eliminate all one item customers, but try to move one item customers up to the second item. Ways to do this would be to have your crop mix, including the top selling items, of course, to perhaps try different arrangements. And I don't have specific advice, like always put your tomatoes next to your lettuces. Uh, that would take some experimentation, but maybe rearranging the, the market stand. There has been research on how the products are displayed in grocery stores and the impact on sales. And I can tell you that while I'm not familiar with that research, they do find positive effects, meaning that you can rearrange for better sales. So that's something that you could certainly experiment with. You could run specials uh, just to try to influence people to buy more than one item. You know, um, you know, buy any bag of greens two for seven, or you know, buy any, pick any four items for twenty for twenty bucks. So these kind of um, sort of bundling sales that encourage people to buy more than one item would be another way to drive them those one item customers up. And finally, uh, from the farms that participated in the project, they said they. Anecdotally, they've had really good luck just suggesting item pairings. So when their customer picks a green bell pepper um, to, to purchase, they say, you know what would go great with this, you know, pepper is, is an onion. And they say anecdotally, they have really good luck. The customer tends to say, oh yeah, you're right, grab an onion as well. So they just push that person from one item up to two. So suggested pairings and item suggestions are a good idea. And, and with any of this, what, what, um, what we're going to be able to do with the project that we're going to do with NOFA Vermont and what I'm suggesting to you to do it on your own is that once you have a baseline set of data for your farm and you've experienced sales for a while, then you can test. You can do little experiments, rearrange the stand, see what happens. Is there an adjustment to the baseline? Is it positive or negative? So it, it actually you know, could be scientific and um, beneficial. Now we're gonna look at increasing customer spending through product pricing. Basically, let's talk about increasing prices. Uh, particularly, you can raise prices on fast moving and popular items. It, it kind of is about, um, you know, supply and demand, if you will. 
the higher the price goes, the demand is going to is going to fall somewhat. Um, but you don't have to be worried about losing some customers over price increases because you can still make the same amount of money when you lose a few customers but have higher prices. And I've given you just a basic example here. Um, if you're selling lettuce at $2.75 a head and you typically sell 200 heads at a market, then you're grossing 550 bucks. If you increase that price all the way up to $3.50 a head and you lose a fraction of, of customers who look at that price and, and move on, you're still going to make $550. In fact, you're going to have extra lettuce heads to either sell in another market or at least that you didn't have to harvest, wash, transport, and so on. So um, price changes you know, are a necessity as your farm's costs go up. Uh, like I said, here in Ithaca in 2007, a, a bunch of kale was $3. And in 2018, it was, it was still $3. Um, I asked those farms if their cost of production had gone up in the last decade. And of course they said yes. So, you know, price changes are, aren't something to be afraid of. Um, and even if there's a few customers who don't buy the item, it doesn't mean that farm sales are going to decrease. So I just wanted to, to let people know that. And I use these numbers for pricing head lettuce as a hypothetical example to, to teach you this. But from our top selling items chart that we had earlier, the average head lettuce purchase uh, in the project was $3.72. So I don't think 350 is actually too high because I have data from 2018 that says when people buy head lettuce, on average, they spend $3.72. So we can feel pretty confident with that 350. Okay, there's something called price elasticity. And what it is, it's a measure of price sensitivity in customers. So I just want to introduce that concept in case anyone's not familiar with it. Tobacco is always a great uh, item to talk about. So the idea of price elasticity is that as the price changes, and let's say as the price increases, there are um, customers who won't buy it. So the degree to which you lose customers with price changes is referred to as elasticity. Tobacco is an example of what we call a price inelastic item. In other words, because people really need to have their tobacco, um, as the price goes up, they continue to buy the same amount. So we would call it inelastic. Other things, I don't know the price elasticity of head lettuce, but let's just say, um, you know, Starbucks coffees. If the Starbucks coffee price were to increase by 75%, uh, we'd find out how elastic it was, right? Because there's going to be a number of people that go and look at that price and, and refuse to buy it. So there's this concept of elasticity, and we don't have it for, uh, we don't have it calculated for vegetables in local foods, but it is something that we're going to be working on in our research at Cornell using point of sale. I just wanted to introduce the, the concept to you. The idea in its application here is that if you went from $3 per head up to $3.50, um, you know, your chances are that the number of units you sell would not suffer too much. Okay, in any research project, there's always this thing that I didn't expect to find that I find. And for this project, the unexpected find was the number of customers that were spending $3 or less. This became something that really stuck out to me. Um, so I started to track it for all the farms in the project and all the individual markets. So the range, you can see is quite broad there. The percent of, of customers that spent $3 or less with any, at any given market was as low as 14% of customers. That would be a great number, I think. And as high as 45%, so nearly half of their customers spending three dollars or less so the the average across all markets was was 28 percent of customers here's what drew my attention to it as i was working with the data from the project i saw this one particular market day where the farm grossed uh 1226 dollars and they had 210 customers so i broke the spending of those customers up into four groups only two customers that day spent $20 or more with the farm. 120 customers spent $5 or less. Out of 210 customers, 120 spent $5 or less. And then there were um, a few in each group in between. We put that out in this graph over here. 
what you see is the sort of cash contribution to the daily gross sales of each group. The, the group who spent $5 or less took a lot of busy time from the farm, right? It was dealing with 120 different transactions. And that group collectively only gave the farm $347. So those higher spending customers are a lot more value, valuable. Um, just, just 59 of them, half the number, contributed more to the farm uh, than, than the 120. So this, you know, this is what got me thinking about um, a lot of the concepts that I introduced in the previous slides. The idea is to try to get more out of the 120 people. How do we do that? Tax size, item count, customers, you know, items per customer, and pricing. Uh, my um, my position as a as a ag extension person is sort of in defense of farms, and I feel like, man, these people had to work really hard to deal with 120 customers for this small contribution to their bottom line. And, and you know, we could eliminate those low priced items and improve the results for the farm. Okay, so simple math. If you, higher prices, increase customer spending, right? If we increase, if we raise all our prices, customers will spend more when they shop with us. But our average daily gross sales may not necessarily increase if fewer people shop with us, right? So that's the worry about price changes or price increases is people feel like if I raise my prices, fewer people will shop with me. But, but, but you know, as a fact, your customer spending will increase because you raised your prices. Here's what I have to say as an encouragement about price increases. The farms in this project that had the highest prices also had the highest customer spending, which we would expect, the highest value per item, which we would expect because they have the highest prices. They were the top grossing farms. So we, we might not have known that for sure because we thought, well, they might lose so many customers that they don't really have a great day. They were actually grossing higher than farms with lower prices. And it didn't hurt the number of items that customers bought from them. So we thought maybe, maybe everybody else is going to sell two items per customer, but because of their high prices, they're only going to sell one item per customer. But we did not observe that. They had the same kind of items per customer that everybody else had. And therefore, they were, they were among the top grossing. So the higher prices really ultimately have a positive effect. Um, this farm would gross, you know, well, there's, there's more than one, but these, these, these high priced farms would gross more than the farm that to had 210 customers on the same day, but deal with far fewer people. So that's just uh, a pep talk about price increases, and, you know, you know, managing them. Uh, and, and actually NOFA had a great um, presentation that I was part of a few weeks ago where they talked about how to handle price increases in terms of communicating that to your customer. And I, I suspect that's probably recorded and you can go back and look at that. So. Okay, all this data, it gets a little tricky because we have all these moving parts. Like I said, like, well, if our prices, we raise our prices up, then our customer numbers go down. So where does that leave our gross sales? Um, just know that there's a lot of moving parts. Larger, larger customer transactions do not necessarily mean larger daily sales because the chance that we'll lose some customers. And let me give you an example from the data. We found, and this was a surprise, cold weather customers spend more than warm weather customers. But there are so few of them that cold weather markets experience lower gross sales. So you see we have three sliders that we're moving here. Um, and the ultimate outcome is that even though these customers spend more because there's fewer people coming out to the market on a cold day, we're gonna experience lower gross sales. And I'll just show that to you really quickly with um, some statistics. So I have a partner on campus who does the statistics. I'm not a linear regression maven, but I can tell you what the slide means. <laughs> I'll, I do all my statistic work in Excel. I don't use the, the big uh, 
software packages. But what this says is this is a customer transaction size. If the number has a little asterisk, it means that that, that determinant of customer transaction size is statistically significant. And then if it's a positive number, it means it adds that many cents to the customer's transaction. So the one I want to draw your attention to is cold weather. It's st statistically significant. And what we found is that cold weather customers increase their average transaction size by 37 cents. And since the average customer transaction size was what, $6.40, 37 is nothing to sneeze at. So these people have spent more money. And th this is over 20,000 transactions. Um, so great, they're spending more on cold weather days, 37 cents more per customer or per transaction. But now let's look at daily sales. Cold weather total sales were hurt by $90 a day. So there weren't enough of those cold weather customers spending more to, to help our day. And finally, what we see here is we got about 22 fewer customers per market on a cold weather day. So that's why we lost the $90. So there's all these moving pieces and it, you know, it's, it's a lot to think about. The point is to start somewhere, start recording uh, and then start to make small improvements. All right, I just have a, a couple of slides left and then we can have questions and discussion. A few other notes from the project I wanted to talk about. We did not set out to determine the impact of market size on individual vendor sales, but we did get a glimpse into that. You know, um, around here, I know it's been debated at some of our smaller markets. They already have one chicken vendor and someone else has come around and wants to sell chickens at that market. And then they debate, you know, sometimes there's hurt feelings. Do we let that second chicken vendor in or not? Are we just gonna take the same size pie and cut it smaller, that kind of discussion. What we observed in, in this project is that <clears throat> as we increase the number of vendors in a market, it has a negative effect on daily sales for any individual vendor. So in theory, yes, adding another vendor to that, another chicken vendor to that market would just mean um, lower daily sales for the, for the two of them. Uh, it also had a negative effect on customer count. So the number of customers shopping at that market doesn't change necessarily with an added vendor and therefore dividing the sales up among the existing vendors. But it does have a positive effect on transaction size. So shoppers who shop at markets with a large, larger number of vendors seem to come prepared to spend more money. And, and they do spend more money at larger markets. Think about preparing to go shopping at a, a farmer's market with 15 vendors and then preparing to go shop at a market with 90 vendors. For some reason, uh, customers at the 90 vendor markets are gonna spend more money with individual farms. That's what we were able to observe. And that, that's, a, that's a spot that someone could definitely do more research going forward. I wanted to mention our recording accuracy. So what that means is that we asked the farmers to tell us their total cash box uh, balance at the end of the day, and we would compare it to the transactions recorded in Square. So we could determine how many transactions they captured and how many they missed. And across the project, our average was 90%. So they were recording, you know, if they got really busy or they missed a few sales in the morning because they didn't get the iPad out of the truck yet, that would explain the 90%. But we captured 90% of the transactions, which was pretty good. Uh, a measure of success for me with that project was that uh, when we started the project, one of the eight was using point of sale software. And by the end, um, six out of the eight said that they planned to use it in the 2020 season. And this is a quote from a farm that I really had to strong arm into doing the project with me. She's a good friend and I had to beg her. And two weeks into the project, she said, how were we ever not doing this? So that was for me a, a great success. And she still uses it today. Um, summary, choose a metric to focus on uh, for your farm based on your data, You know, get a baseline and then start to introduce changes at the market and see if you can have a positive effect. Um, that can include raising item values, looking at your crop selection and how you display it, engaging customers during slow times, arriving early and being completely ready to sell before the market starts, and possibly raising prices. Nova Vermont is going to do a point of sale project just, just like the one that I did with fruit and vegetable growers this, uh, this upcoming season. 
uh, Bill and I will be working together on this. Um, the farms that we're recruiting into the project would be selling primarily fruits and vegetables. Um, you would have to set up each item that you sell in the point of sale. So, you know, that's with uh, the name and the price and the unit. Uh, and then record all your customer transactions uh, in the software. Share those reports with us. So in the case of Square, you don't have to use Square. There are other point of sale platforms out there. We just have to make sure that we could get reports on item sales and transactions. So in Square, that's two different reports. One gives you um, basically gives you a row in Excel for every individual item sold. And then the other report is a line for every transaction total in those right now. I suspect that all point of sale software systems will reproduce, produce these reports um, to, to put into Excel. What you'll benefit from is that you'll receive summary reports from us, like monthly reports and seasonal reports, and then receive specific advice on how you might increase daily sales or customer counts. I mean, it all ultimately boils down to average daily gross sales. Uh, and in addition, you'll receive some one-on-one -on -one technical assistance from Bill and uh, me. Uh, we're only gonna be able to accept 10 farms into this because of the, the workload on our side. And Bill will share uh, in the chat box an application form for anyone that wants to apply to be part of the project. I wanna mention that I wrote a short article. I think it's you know two, two and a half pages long. If you search Cornell Smart Marketing and look at this publication that came out in January of 2020, like I said, you'll find about two pages on the point of sale research that I did. And, and finally, I just wanted to share my email. I'll put it in the chat box as well. But if you have questions about the project, um, you're interested in it, you can you can always contact Bill or me. That we can take on question and discussion. I'm assuming that everyone is just sitting here as mind blown as I was the first time that I saw you present on this and maybe they're still formulating those questions. Um, I will, I will just give a plug though, as Matt said, I am as a, as a avowed data nerd, I am super excited to run this project this year um, for this upcoming market season. So if you're at all interested, you know, fill out the, fill out the application, get in touch and, and we can talk about it a little more. Maybe it's, maybe it's, you know, you're kind of on the fence about it. We can sort of talk through it. Um, you know, as Matt said, it, it's, it shouldn't be at all a heavy lift. It really, it, it should be easy. It should be stuff you're mostly doing anyway. This is just going to give you some data that's kind of easily manipulated and, and we can really build some advice and some, some sort of technical assistance off of. Yeah, I agree. You know, it it's really for the rich data that you get, it's not too intense. Like, uh, you know, even when I was a grad student, asking people to keep notebooks and keep logs and keep records was a lot more difficult than just having an iPad at your market stall and, you know, hitting a few things on the screen with each customer. It's, it's brilliant what they came out with um, and the way that we can use it. Andrew here from the Vermont Farmers Market Association. Um, we just had a presentation from the folks behind Eat from Farms, which is a point of sale system. Um, they're actually based out of upstate New York. Um, what are they called? Eat from Farms. Okay. And um, you, you might not be able to plug a specific online point of sale system, um, but they were great. Uh, there's a few farmer's markets in Vermont that are using them um, for the whole farmer's market, um, but they were actually primarily designed for the individual producer to use at their uh, booth or at their farm stand um, as an online POS. So I will happily plug them because they're great. <laughs> Good to know about too. I, I hadn't heard of them. You're muted. 
<laughs> Sorry. Um, they're farmers themselves and um, their solution to this sort of big move towards online point of sale systems was to build the one that they wanted to use. Yeah. And, and yeah, I don't plug any particular one. The reason I chose Square for our project is, um, well, because it's, it's free. You know, you, if you don't run a credit card, you'll never spend a dime. You can set it all up and all that. Um, and it runs on, you know, iPads and uh, the other kind. Samsung is, what's the word? <laughs> you can see I'm not a technology, you know, not either. But uh, you can run it on both kinds. And, you know, they have pretty decent customer support and all that. But, yeah, any, any point of sale system that can produce the same outputs works. Android, thank you. Androids uh, <laughs> and iPads. Although I'll tell you, I had a bunch of interns. And with our project, we loaned out. Um, iPads to the farms and then um, we needed more and the interns told me to go and buy Samsung tablets because they're cheaper so I went out and bought them and uh, they did not run Square as well we had more errors and lost data on the Samsungs than the iPads so just a um, 20 summer of 2018 experience if I were to repeat that part of it I would just buy iPads because they ran it they ran it better and you know, for me, it was heartbreaking to lose a day of data <laughs> uh, to a the problem with the tablet. Matt, a, a lot of these run on like tablet and like phones. Did you see any difference there? We didn't have anybody use it on their phone. I think mostly just because of the screen size, people just wanted to see everything a bit bigger. Um, didn't see a problem with that. Uh, you know, I should mention that you don't have to have a data plan to use this either. It works offline. So you, uh, in the case of Square in 2018, you had to be connected to data to log in. So you could log in at home on your home Wi-Fi, right? And then you could go and do the entire market offline and just save it on the iPad. And when you got back home on a Wi-Fi, that's when it would upload it. So it's not that you need to have a special data plan or cell reception to do this. Um, almost all the transactions in our project were cash transactions. If you're running a credit card, then it's nice to have that data connection to verify that the card is good. Uh, but when it comes to fruits and vegetable sales, we found that credit cards were not often used. I think that would be different if you were selling meat products. You know, we tend to use credit cards more because they're bigger businesses. Um, hi. Um, I joined tonight because I, I saw that you were presenting this and thank you very much. Um, I learned a lot. I, I've seen it used in farm stores where people, you know, find ways to kind of bolt their iPads down. Um, cause like our farm store, we, it's the honor system. Um, but it, it really, it, yeah, I you know I have I have the square that goes on my iPad. I don't I've not downloaded the software, but um, I I just took away a lot of information. I think I can use in my farm store, as well as you know I have some farmers market experience, but um, we sell from our farm primarily. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. So you're using a you're using a roadside stand with an honor system payment, and and you. Put an iPad out there so people can run a credit card. Um, this other little farm store in the area has done that. Oh, I see. Yep. They they when they they just built the farm store in the last year and a half or so, and they had a carpenter that you know made a special holder for their iPad. So you know, I mean, they, they still worry that someone's going to like unbolt the thing and walk away with it, but it hasn't happened. And a good friend of mine, you know, instead of buying a new iPad, she recently bought a refurbished one. And I just wonder if something like that for $250 instead of, you know, $800 um, would yep. work just as well in a farm store with Square on it. Mm -hmm. And it would make it so that we could take credit cards easy enough.
It's right in our dooryard, the farm store. So, you know, people are coming and going all the time. So. Thank you. I think one other one other point too, just to just on that a little bit on like the refurb side. I have a, a friend of mine for their farm. They actually went on Front Porch Forum and asked if anybody had an old tablet they could use, and someone just gave it to them. So you know, it's it doesn't have to be you know. I think Matt kind of made this point. It doesn't have to be like the latest and greatest technology. It just needs to work and you know have enough battery life to kind of get you through the day. So. Yeah, I was going to mention that the farm that said, how are we ever not doing this? She put out an email to all her customers. Did anyone have an iPad and someone gave her one? So people have their three and four year old ones just sitting in a drawer at their house. So one of her customers gave it to her. So you kind of spoke about a variety of uh very kind of general global data collection. What um, we are already using a point of sale system for our farmers markets. We basically from day one said we had to track every sale. We wanted to be able to get that granularity of information. What other information, you know, besides time and amount and product do you think would be worthwhile for collecting on an individual farm level? You mean besides what you already get in the point of sale software? Well, I mean, you know, we we can target additional, you know, like this is not necessarily realistic for every, for in, an, in a, a widespread data collection effort to try and get, uh, you know, really specific information, but we can potentially get more specific information, um, you know, by either tracking customers or tracking, you um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I haven't really fully conceptualized what other things we could easily track, but, um, you know, we could build a, you know, a counter to count basically how often people, what our purchase rate is for people walking by or um, sure. that, yeah. that kind of information or, you know, like every time somebody crosses the threshold of the stand, try and be, take away to, to get that information. Um, um, but I'm just curious if you have like, if you have conceptualized other, other points of data in a farmer's market setting that would be worthwhile to try and uh, get, but is not necessarily as easy to capture as, uh, you know, what, where, when. Right, yeah, I, I haven't, you know, thought beyond that. It, It'd be nice from some of these markets to get um, customer accounts for the market. You know, like I know Ithaca Farmers Market, they don't have customer accounts for the market. First of all, they have like six points of entry. Um, so it'd be really tough for them to count them, but we don't know how many people are there uh, to, to sort of use that as a gauge. I think your idea about tracking individual customers, you know, Square does allow you to do that. If you have sort of a loyalty program, if they want to identify themselves every time they shop with you, um, they can type their phone number in and then, you know, enter your loyalty program. So you could start looking at individuals. But frankly, I, I think what what you can already work with, you know, I don't know how you're using it, but it, it's so rich um, that you could, you know, you could use the data you already receive from your point of sale and then just start to introduce small changes for the effects that you want. So identify a goal. Um, try to get our one item customer, more of our one item customers up to two items and then test it for two weeks and see if you have a positive effect. That's, it's, I want to call it a game and it's not totally a game, but it's almost a game. Uh, you know, try something out, see what the effect is. Uh, it might have a negative effect, then you know that. Thank you. I, I really like this project and um, I, I find it's hard for me to We'll give you a minute, Karen.
Thanks a lot, Bill and Matt. Um, I have to sign off, but if anybody has any questions related to farmers markets, do you feel free to reach out to me? Um, I'd be happy to correspond with you. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. It's good Thanks seeing you. Thanks for coming. Karen, are you back? No pressure. You can you can ask your question now. Sorry, my husband was washing dishes and there was a ton of clanking. <laughs> but <laughs> like, oh, I better mute this. Okay. So um, yeah, I I like this project a lot. And, but we're in kind of an irregular buying pattern with our customers right now because we have so much going, flowing out by way of pre-order for pickup at the market, um, a lot of pre-orders. And I, in part, I'm just looking for better ways to manage our pre-buy CSA, freestyle market stand membership program. So just kind of like pulling that all into one thing. But I feel like our consumer buying habits, we, ha we did sell at the market, but not in as fulsome a way as we usually do last summer, because we saw a tremendous volume flowing through our pre-order system, which was pretty rinky-dink too, and we're looking to upgrade that, as Bill knows. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, I love this in part just when I think of, you know, we're doing a terrible job as business people filling out our agricultural census <laughs> and, and really dialing into our crop profitability. And there are just so many things that, you know, and how we are running our business that, you know, can flow out of a management tool like this. And, you know, we're people who always have kept manual inventory sheets over the years. And I could tell you how many heads of lettuce I sold in July of 2013. And nice. about a few years ago when we stopped being quite as into that. But um, yeah, I, this is, um, as we head into the preseason, I'm, you know, I'm liking all of this thinking. Um, and I, I don't think that we're really good candidates for the study because of how irregular our, our customers' buying patterns are right now. But, um, and we also, we, we used to go to three farmers markets a week and a tool like this would have made some of those decisions about which of those markets to boot a little easier. Um, I love that just for how you can really, really crunch those numbers on what sells where. And um, I, I think that that I think is one of those other little granular elements, really comparing markets, market to market, what is selling where so you can fine tune your inventory and get the right inventory to the right. Because you know, we, we sell at three markets that are very different. Um, you know, Bennington is a beach town, Dorset is not, that kind of thing. But this data would have told us that. It took us a few years to figure that out and this data would have revealed that sooner. So anyway, that's all I have to say. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, 2020 was, so I had, I did this, all these, all this work in 2018 season. And then because I worked at Accenture, it took me until the, after the 2019 season to present the results to the farm. So it was December of 2019. I was like, here's what we learned from your 2018 season. And none of us knew what was three months away. And so, yeah, I mean, this, this last season might not, have, wouldn't have been beneficial to, to do this project in 2020 um, because the shift to online, because of increased CSAs and because farmers markets were, were pretty wonky just in terms of COVID restrictions. We had, um, you know, shopper attendance restrictions. Only a certain number of people could be in the market at a time, and all that kind of stuff. So hopefully we're going to see normalization in 2021. But um, yeah, 2020 was a weird one. So, uh, so people are feeling like, in general, like there will be a a return to more normal or do people really like this pre-order gig where they can trot up to their regular stands so quickly and, and get their pre-orders i i just wonder you know about that consumer mindset these days Same. And, and what others are thinking about that well lots of surveys 
through the years have said that the number one reason that people do not shop at farmers markets is because they're inconvenient. And I think we just solved that with the pre-order pickup thing. So really like to see what, what it's going to do. Uh, and thanks to those online systems, you still get ordering data. I mean, the time of day that they order is less important, but you still get customer transaction data from your online ordering system. So there's still an opportunity to look through that and you know try to alter it. Yeah, uh, remains to be seen. I tell you, nothing causes technology adoption like a pandemic, right? <laughs> every every market around here had been dragging their feet on this idea on, you know, and then all of a sudden they had it implemented very quickly. And I will also mention that um, I, I'm down in the southwestern corner of Vermont and um, uh, Eat From Farms was adopted by our market. Um, and there's sort of a sub account for each. And we're actually not plugged into it because I think we, we'll probably go with a, a different platform for our farm. We've been wiggling around that decision, but um, the market as a whole has had a positive experience with Eat From Farms. If, if you are looking just to second the comments that were made earlier about Eat From Farms. Yeah, I, a couple of the shoppers have complained about it a little bit, but I, it's not the most elegant of um, those platforms out there, but it is yeah, it's very good and it's um, very reasonably priced. Our pizza is almost ready, so I'm going to bow out now. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna leave it on the million dollar question of what what will this year's farmers market season look like? Yeah. If anyone here knew that, I think we'd be we'd be in really good shape. But cool. Well. Unless there's any other questions, I think we can we can leave it there. You know, I think I really appreciate Matt coming and, and sharing your knowledge, and we will um, you'll be you'll be seeing some more information about this project as it goes forward. I'm gonna start to kind of make the push to get some folks enrolled. So, Karen, even if you're not a good uh, candidate, tell your friends <laughs> we're we're looking for we're looking for you know a few good a few good farms to to be involved. So, but yeah, well, thanks yeah, everybody. Thank thanks, you. Matt. Thanks everybody. Have a good night. Yeah, take it easy. See ya.